the year is 2050. The world has become a ghost of its former self, riddled with diseases, devastated by war, and ravaged by catastrophic natural disasters. Humanity hangs by a thread on the brink of unraveling. The apocalypse has become the crux of tall tales, myths, and fiction. It will be a savior to some from the misery of life and a nightmare to others. Conspiracy theorists warn of comets and cataclysms, aliens, zombies, monsters, and meteors. Yet, it arrives like a whisper, unsettling but not alarming. Like the first gust of wind in a gathering storm, it grows. And from the chaos, a new evil arises. The administration, a totalitarian global government that rules the country with an iron fist. As the climate changes and the earth responds with wildfires, droughts, earthquakes, tsunamis, and storms, conflicts over dwindling resources arise and the rumors of wars are made manifest. Nation fighting against nation, setting the stage for the administration to establish its dominion. In Quadrant 4, an ethnic hub just outside of the capital city, the people live and work under an oppressive cloud of fear and despair. But hope, as it does, persists through adversity even in the darkest of times. The resistance, an underground group of dissenters, becomes the sole threat to the administration's hold. The stage is set for a battle that will determine the fate of the world. Yamaro, a second-generation West African, gives birth to her sensitive and spiritually gifted son, Soku. To keep him safe from the administration's gaze, she tries to keep Soku from embracing his true nature. His grandmother, Bandome, a witch trained in the traditions of her people, recognizes Soku as the child in her visions, the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy, a gatekeeper who will lead the revolution to end all revolutions. Bandome counters Yamaro by teaching Soku the ways of the ancient gatekeepers, those with one foot in this world and one in the next, maintaining the balance between them. One night, in the midst of a horrific storm, Soku's initiation begins. Soku repeats what Bandome taught him. My ears are open. I'm ready to hear. I'll stay and listen. I'll have no fear. Who are you? We are time, space, memory. Love, harmony, friction, balance. I don't understand. We are the ones that are, that came before, that will be. 
okay, that clears things up. We call to you because you have ears to hear. So listen carefully. What is happening now has happened before. They will take everything from you if you let them. Just like the missionaries, the explorers, the settlers that came to our people with lies and broken promises. They ridiculed our beliefs, turned our gods into foolish myths, and our practices into wild superstitions. There will come a day when you will stand before them, and they will tremble far beyond your fear, past your anger, are the keys to the kingdom. When you reach Deep inside, you will find them. Gifts so brilliant, they will blind the vultures that have ravished this world. If you fail, see the future that awaits us. As Soku takes in what he sees, suddenly there is a banging on the door of the quarters. Yamaro and Bandome awaken and step into the main living area. Yamaro cautiously opens the door and immediately three agents of the administration forcefully enter. The agents begin to question Yamaro about her association with Michael Stone, the captured leader of the underground resistance movement, and Soku's father. As the administration agents move in to take Yamaro and Bandome, Soku enters from the back. Help! thing ever created, that your thoughts were divine in your word law, told you you will never have anything unless you take it, that there is no such thing as thievery because everything is owed to you. There is no rape because your desire is pure, your thirst for flesh justified. There is no torture, just correction. There is no God but you, 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 and you believe them. You soaked it up into your skin like sweat and dirt. You believe you didn't need a God because you were God. They lied to you, but the truth about a lie is that it will always die while the truth remains an eternal flame. That cannot be destroyed. Tell your leaders their reign will not last forever. When the earthen shell is broken and the spirit is set free and the light of truth is spoken to release them just to be fully, truly be fully, truly free. Soku's entire being is filled with light. One agent runs out of the room, then another. 
The last agent looks around the room and decides to make a run for it as well. They are gone. The door shuts itself behind them. Before Baldome can teach Shoku to master his gifts, the family residence faces another attack by administration agents. Shoku concentrates, trying to summon his newfound powers. The agents take out their guns. Come on, Shoku. You can do this. Focus. Come on. Nothing happens. The administration agents move in. Baldome is shot. Yamaru is taken captive, and young Soku runs for his life through the dark streets of the capital city. Your destiny was never going to be easy, Soku. But that is the contract you made before your birth. Destiny calls us to walk into the fire, past our fear, through our pain, to our destiny. Those with a great destiny endure great pain. One day it will be clear to you why this had to be and what you must do. Alone in the dark lands, Soku learns to be his own guardian and adapt to the merciless wilderness or die trying. He navigates treacherous terrain, fighting off rabid dogs, outsmarting robbers, and escaping mutated humans, twisted by the effects of disease and biological weapons. These are the remnants of a world that has lost its way. After years of solitude, Soku, now 18, comes upon a figure in the distance. His eyes are drawn to a billowing cloth of many colors dancing against the unforgiving wind. A splash of color amidst the bleak desolation. Soku's curiosity and captivation lead him to Damien, a frail and beautiful soul left to starve in an elevated cage. Openly queer and non-binary, Damien has lived outside of the lines and caught the attention of the administration, who tortured him and put him on display as a warning for others who might dare to be their full selves. Soku frees Damien from his cage and tends to his wounds, and together they navigate the dark lands, forming a bond forged in adversity. A resistance soldier finds them and convinces them to join the resistance, promising food, shelter, and a strategy to fight the administration. Soku becomes a lethal weapon for the resistance, with the only remaining softness in his life being Damien, who he has grown to love more than he has courage and words to express. During an attack by the administration, Damien is critically wounded and falls into a coma. The weight of losing another person to the administration takes its toll on Soku. He snaps, straps himself with explosives, and journeys back to the administration's headquarters in the capital city to take them out once and for all. You took everything from me. Took away everyone that ever loved me. So I have nothing else to lose. Soku's bravery emboldens the onlookers who echo his demand for freedom. Soku is caught up in the moment, 
which gives one of the administration soldiers a clear shot. A bullet pierces Soku. He falls, detonating his armor of explosives. Soku's spirit is transported to the Ancestor Realm, where he is embraced by Bangdome, who is surrounded by Ancestor Spirits. I told you when you were young, your gift lies in your sensitivity. But you became hard and cut off access to the gates, to the power of this realm, and most devastatingly, to your own power. You must be reborn. You forgot who you are. We are here to remind you. He is sent back into his body with his gifts amplified and fully activated. With his new powers, an army of resistance soldiers, and emboldened residents, Soku fulfills the prophecy igniting a revolution to end all revolutions. The administration is defeated. Soku rescues his mother Yamara, who has been the captive of the administration, and revives Damien. And finally, something new has filled the void left by fear, a way of being that had all but been forgotten. The people are free and there is peace.
this year is going to be great. Ashe. I'm so excited to get us started. We'll probably chat. I'll ask a few questions. We'll probably last about 20 minutes. That way you get a chance to kind of look around at what we have before we end our time together. Let's start with you, Germano. Can we talk a little bit about um, what inspired you to write this piece? And I'm actually going to switch mics because somehow this one feels <laughs> way more powerful. <laughs> Releasing your power from this way soon. <laughs> um, well, interestingly, these two gentlemen here are the reason that I know about um, the term gatekeepers. So I met Dr. John Martin Green 47 years ago. Um, wow, you were supposed to laugh because there's no way I'm 47 years old. Um, <laughs> you can't be that old. Anyway, so I met Dr. John Martin Green, um, I think it was the second year of the Fire This Time Festival. Um, whoo, Fire This Time in the house. Um, so it was, uh, I was writing a play about uh, sexuality and spirituality and how the black church deals with that. It's called The Anointed. And uh, Dr. John Martin Green was my, was my second director ever in life for anything. And he sat down afterwards and he's like, you should read uh, Of Water and the Spirit um, by Maladoma Patrice Somme. And I said, yes, I'll get right on that. And like several years later, I, I picked it up. But I was also at a conference, um, and I don't remember who um, initiated the conference, but I know Bishop Yvette Funder was speaking, and Dr. Michael was speaking, and he held up this book called The Spirit of Intimacy. And he was like, you are somebody! You are important! And he turned to the page about gatekeepers and the description of gatekeepers being um, people that express themselves as queer, same gender loving, and have one foot in the spirit world, one foot in the spirit in the physical world, and maintain the balance they're in, and lead people to their uh, purpose in life. Um, and that prompted me uh, to start doing my own research. And I discovered that not just in West Africa, but all over the world, people that we call queer, same gender loving, people that. Uh, in the in Burkina Faso would call gatekeepers were two spirit people or um, shamans or witches or judges or and this was all over the world in every continent um, in every country before the world was colonized. Um, my friend Brian Glover actually sent me a map of where all of these people resided all over the world before the world was colonized, and I feel like that process of indoctrinating us um, reversed what was a balanced society that incorporated people that now live outside of the margins. Um, so yeah, that was my, these two gentlemen right here introduced me to the concept and I thankfully got to meet and get the blessing of and have a reading from uh, Maladoma right before he passed. So he was really excited about this piece, and I wish he could have seen it. But he sees it. He sees it. I'm going to ask one more question. It goes to you all. Thank you for that. That's um, really potent and inspiring, and hence why we're talking about this relationship between spiritual technologies and XR technology, which you have experienced and feels like it's at the core of what this piece is doing. I want to turn to Dr. Elam and turn to Dr. Green, and I want to talk a little bit about how you would describe spiritual technology and what that means in your life. Would anyone want to take it first? Um, for me, spiritual technology involves um, taking elements from nature, from the natural world, um, including uh, flora, um, herbs, and such like for medicinal purposes, for healing purposes, and um, also um, ritual practices, uh, all of which are designed to uh, facilitate balance and harmony with nature and with the universe. Um, it's um, really operating on a different vibrational level and understanding 
And when you operate on a different vibrational level, it's the technology opens up and you just see. And in the parts of seeing, you part doing. And so when you're in spaces and places, you've learned to administer the, the medicine to a people who are maybe not familiar with the medicine, but giving it in a way they understand it. And then once they get it, expose it. So it's really operating in that space and trying to bring things in from that vibration, that level, that other world that resides over here. There's so much um, wisdom that exists here that I want to acknowledge. And uh, I'm a healing practitioner as well, myself, which is one of the reasons why I got most excited about what this piece could do. And I'm curious, and this is a question for all of you or some of you, I'm thinking about the impact that we hope that this story might have on audiences. We know that this piece is still in development. We know that we're learning about what this piece is, um, what's important about it, what's important about it to you all, and what do you hope that audiences take with them um, when this piece gets ultimately fulfilled in its final incarnation. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so back in December of 2007, um, I had the privilege, I was then working with an organization called the Black Men's Exchange New York. And we uh, invited Maladoma Somme to do a weekend long symposium with us at City College up in Harlem. Um, where, among other things, he shared with us that um, the gatekeepers, um, as in Dagara cosmology, as, as uh, Germano mentioned, um, are guardians of the community whose charge is facilitating people's alignment with and contribution of their respective gifts to the society. And should anything impede that process, a uh, crisis ensues, whereupon everyone looks for the gatekeepers who reside on the margins of society and who then, taking cues from nature and the ancestors, restore balance and harmony to the collective. Um, something I'm hoping that this piece, which is a hero story, which centers a uh, same gender loving character. Um, uh, which, as Maladoma instructed us, are not always, not all gatekeepers are same gender loving or queer, but all same gender loving or queer people by virtue of what the indigenous Americans reference as our two spirit energetic balance have gatekeeping potential. And what I'm hoping people may take from this piece is, um, no, before I say that, I'm gonna backtrack one more time. Um, something else that he told us, which was both um, chilling and <sighs> challenging, thrilling, chilling and thrilling, um, was that because of colonization um, and the sort of Victorian um, relationship to sexuality, sex and sexuality, um, where sex is looked on as um, something dirty or bad or wrong. Um, people who operate on the sexuality continuum beyond heterosexuality are deemed, um, are demonized and vilified, thereby same gender loving and queer people having been fired from our jobs because we are shunned all over the world where colonization has transpired. And what I'm hoping audiences will take from the piece is a recollection of the fact that, as Germano pointed out, um, gatekeepers, same gender loving queer people are gifted to support, our job is to support each other's aligning with 
and distributing our respective gifts and help to restore us to our original roles in society, if that makes any sense at all. It's strange that um, I worked with um, Dr. Same for two and a half years, um, pr um, different phases, uh, all in New York State, and he came in his travels. And after my initiation, I was like, well, where am I going to go with this technology? And the ancestor said, you're going back to church. Well, I said, how did that going to work? <laughs> but I, I'm engaged in a church that engages in sacred memory. And before they were able to see, they had to heal. And so the process was to get through the trauma. And my, the pro my process was to walk them through the trauma at various stages and bring back the rituals and bring back the rituals and then hide the rituals like I, I would hide the, the talisman. It's like, oh, it's just a package, right? And do things like that and then, and then embrace the scriptures and stuff like that. After 20 some odd years, I'm called the priest because they, I'm in a community that wants to engage in sacred memory. And somebody said, we're dealing with 400 years of damage now we're on the road to healing, but it's taken a long time. And now that I'm here, I see the medicine, I, t I see the technology, I'm helping other people find their medicine and their purpose. And so it was really about what he, what he and I, John Martin and I talked about is that <coughs> it's important. Your technology doesn't work amongst yourselves. You have to engage in a community that engages in sacred memory because that's the only way it's going to work. There is a sacred memory movement in the African-American community that is slowly taking place and slowly moving. And so the need for gatekeepers, the need for this people, this medicine is coming to fruition. But it's going to take time. And I had to realize that even in the community that I was in, when the, the colonization would pop up, I'd have to say, oh, you don't know who you are. Okay, and keep it moving. I still got to, as one person that was part of my initiation, she had, it was a ritual at night, and I think it was raining, but there were tea lights. And she said, I have to, do, I'm doing this because I'm a gatekeeper. And so they said, what is a gatekeeper? She goes, I don't know what a gatekeeper is. All I know, I have to keep these tea lights lit because the tea lights were an important part of the ritual. So no matter what obstacle you faced, no matter what obstacle, in the, even in the colonization, people not remembering, you still have your medicine and you still have to keep the lights on. I'm struck by what it means to have gatekeepers in our presence right now. Struck by it. And so moved that um, this work that has been birthed allows for that knowledge, that wisdom to go beyond even just this room and impact so many people. So I just want to take a moment to thank you for your service. Thank you for conjuring this text. Thank you for the work that you do as a priest. Thank you for the work that you do as a healer as a wise soul. I'm going to ask a couple more questions, and then I may turn to just see if there's anyone in the audience who might have a question they might want to ask these gatekeepers. Um, I'm going to turn back for a moment just to what this week was like, your growth, your evolution, what are the biggest things that you felt like, culture hub. Whoop. Beautiful. Um, helped inspire in you about this journey and the evolution of this piece? Well, um, so I'm coming off of the heels of a pretty intense uh, employment situation. And this has actually caused me to learn some things about myself outside of the piece. Um, 
And the last few, and I've been blessed to have residencies, period. But the last few residencies have been pushing me to play. And I'm like, yeah. Uh, so what's the date that this is going to happen? <laughs> and then how did, like, well, you're supposed to explore. I'm like, exploring, got it. Um, so then on page five, and it's like, okay, Geronimo, this is an experiment, right? It's an experiment. And I'm, I, I had to stop, and I'm like, why do I do this? Like, why am I, like, so regimented? <laughs> and, like, well, goal-oriented, we say, is a good thing, but it's something that was also taught. So it's like, why, why can't I just stop and play and explore? And I think it sort of goes sort of what we were talking about. Like, I've been in an environment that is not necessarily aligned with um, who I am as a creative person, as a spiritual person, as a person that explores, um, a person that um, gathers stories. Um, so... I learned about I learned that about myself that that's something to work on. Um, I also have been blessed with this incredible staff, and nothing I say will be able to um, express what I experienced here. For someone who has a story that they're like carrying and they want to see it developed, to have people that don't say no but say we'll figure it out and have and create a space for you to explore and create a space for you to see what's in your head that's a, that's amer that's amazing um so my hats off to culture hub everyone here has been warm and patient hey, and and brilliant and it's i couldn't ask for a better creative development situation and thank you as well because had it not been for Musical Theater Factory and you working with us, we wouldn't have anything to play with <laughs> to give to Culture Hub. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Teresa. I second that motion. Thank you. Tremendous thanks to Brisa Munoz and uh, Brandon Powers, both of whom um, have been teaching us about um, XR technology, including um, um, depth kit capture, um, volumetric capture, motion capture. Thank you, Papa. Um, here at Culture Hub, um, everyone is so gracious <laughs> and so kind. And uh, to Germano's lovely point, there are no no's here. There are no, we can't do that. Uh, there is, yes, let's figure this out. And so um, I have learned, I can tell you, um, to the extent that we are seeking to create um, an immersive theater experience in which the audience um, experiences the world of the play as do the characters. Um, we are looking to use this extended reality technology to animate the spiritual realm. And um, something that was a lot of fun for us this week was um, learning how to um, upload all of our visual assets, the slides and things that we've collected, the images we collected, um, um, into uh, a projection design using multiple screens towards beginning to create the world of the play and punctuate the action of the play. So we're not going to be working with illustrations. We're go they're going to have to be real people <laughs> on the stage. But um, th that was so much fun, so exciting and so much fun. And they are so skilled that in the space, in this tiny space of a week, we were able to mount this little structure for you guys. Also, in terms of the sound design, mm -hmm. at which he's already, in his own right, masterful, um, learning about surround sound and how that can um, create an, an immersive experience. How did you, well, you, you all will tell us how you found it. Um, Tremendous fun, and uh, d deeply indebted to you, Culture Hub. Thank you.
Well, I'm definitely I'm, I'm in awe of the piece, and I, s I already got a vision, and I'll be talking to you about it. <laughs> I'll be talking to you about it. Um, yes, the it's it's in line with the sacred memory movement, and I think communities have to recognize um, who's in their community, and I think we have. I mean, we have the Bayard Rustins who operate in this medicine despite opposition. We have James Baldwin who operated this medicine despite, and Audrey Lord. You know, they were maybe not being initiated, but they were doing the work, mm -hmm. right? They were doing the work at despite the opposition. So you're doing the work in, in spite of, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of creativity, in the midst of energies, in the midst of everything. And so I already got a vision. So I get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Okay, I'm going to turn it over for our last little portion. Oh, we've got a mic in the audience. How perfect. Um, I'm going to ask if folks have reflections or comments that they'd like to make um, in response to seeing the piece or questions. I see hands. Let's start here. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Reginald Thomas Brown. My pronouns are they and them. I've watched this grow. The, the incarnation is really, it's really grown. I guess my question is, how how do you how do you take what how do you take how do you make it grow? How how what what did you do to make to make it grow like this? I very first met you at Anointed, but when I first saw it, there were people doing all these. So how did that change come? And I mean, it's still growing. I, it's really it's really wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, this is something I was talking uh, with Brandon uh, Powers about um, at MTF. Um, it can be frustrating sometimes when a, a resident, and I don't remember how many I've had, but I've been blessed to have many. But each residency focuses on one aspect. So the first residency I had with Palti Lake Center um, was just about getting an outline. Like, what is the story you want to tell? Um, and then I believe uh, there was a residency at the tank um, that was... Uh, sort of we could do whatever we wanted, but I wanted to see as much as possible. And I probably drove everyone crazy. <laughs> but I wanted to see everything on stage. Uh, so we had a band and we had the art and we had a chorus. Um, and then high arts was just getting the music cleaned and ready. Um, and with Musical Theater Factory, we're working on uh, the story as well as um, we were able to create the avatars that you saw. Um, and I really want to delve into the movement piece. And you were, you were on the screen. I don't know if you saw yourself. Um, <laughs> so you were part of the movement. Thank you. Uh, yes. Bravo. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes um, because there's a huge part of this that's missing um, that can be told with dance. Uh, and our choreographer, um, Jamal Barnes, uh, is is itching to get started. So that's that's my next move, but I'm sure you might have other ideas. Okay. But how we how we make it grow is with money. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, money, opportunities, just a few, like seven or eight. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyone else? I saw someone else's hand here. Yeah, go on ahead. Um, thank you so much for introducing me to uh, the world of gatekeepers. It is foreign to me, so so I learned a lot tonight, and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question about the, the sort of what came off as sort of almost like the voice of God or the narrator, and who's telling the story of the gatekeeper? Who is the who is the storyteller, so to speak? Uh, if you can elaborate on that, and then there was one moment in the in the play which I. Um, in which the hero or the gatekeeper became problematic, and that is when you know when he takes on a suicide belt and blows himself up or they they self up, uh, and then I guess sent back to Earth uh, because of that. Uh, that's how I read the play. And if you could just elaborate on on that aspect of the play because it was provocative, um, and and I felt a bit uncomfortable uh, on that on that that scene. And so if you could just talk more about that scene, thank you. Good. 
Um, okay. Good. Um, yes, good, good, good. So the first one, the first part about the narration. Well, we're using the narration as a device here in this context because we have to tell you more than we can show you as we are here exploring with the technology, it's the technologies we're going to use as we begin, as we move in the direction of production. Uh, but with respect to the, that point in the story where um, Soku um, snaps and straps himself with explosives, um, having determined to take out the administration once and for all, um, that's a moment of a gatekeeper, um, as Bandome tells him, his grandmother tells him once he's blown up everything, um, he's forgotten who he is and has become hard, which she warned him not to do. Um, he has he has stepped away from his sensitivity, wherein lies his power, his sensitivity and his vulnerability in the quest to protect himself and, in, and beyond the myriad of traumas to which he has experienced over the course of his young life. Um, he became hard and that's why he became violent. Violence was the answer he decided once the the only person left who loved him and who he loved, when that person he believed was taken from him, he snapped and behaved as many of us do when hurt people hurt people, traumatized people traumatized people. We're witnessing that right now in Israel and in Ukraine, you know, in Sudan, in Central Republic of Congo, yeah, these are a lot of traumatized people moving about, acting up and acting out in vile ways. And so does he. Yes, Tom. Yeah. Um, I want to, in self destructive behavior, right? Um, suicidal or um, involuntary suicidal behavior that takes place. And I remember myself standing on the edge of a platform at a train station waiting for the train but not to get on it, but to get in front of it. And I remember a voice said, sit your ass in the waiting room and sit down and don't move. And then I realized it was my grandfather. He was a motor man. And victims who step in front of the train victimize the motor man. They take years to recover or don't recover at all. And then um, there was, um, and I always say this, I think they counseled with the creator and they said, we don't get this boy into a place, he's going to kill himself. And so they found me a church. Now, I don't know why <laughs> they did that, but they found me in a, in a black Baptist church where I had to first come out of the closet, then I had to come into knowing. Can I tell a quick yeah. story? Now this is prompting my own um, similar situation, but I was also suicidal um, because of my experience being closeted and in the black church. I was uh, ordained at 20. Um, and I think that... Week before last. Yeah, <laughs> I'm only 24. Um, but I think that the thing that saved me was one, leaving the church and finding my own path towards uh, the divine, but also being introduced to this concept of um, being a gatekeeper. And I didn't understand, sort of speaking to your question, the trauma of this character until very recently, because I've, of course I have my own trauma. But um, more recently I lost several people, just weeks from each other, my mom, my sister, uh, my uncle and a friend, and um, 
had I not been aligned with what I'm doing, my mind, and this is something that I struggle with, my mind would have slipped back into depression and back into why is this happening and is this even worth it and why do I keep going and is, is it ever going to get better? But I know why I'm here and that saved me um, and it is still saving me. Um, one of the things that Melodoma told me when I, in my reading, which I didn't understand, he said that you're a mineral person. And I'm like, great. Um, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, but, he, you know, cowrie shell reading, and, he, you know, it goes f to the mineral section. And he said, you're a mineral person. So my aunt is now one of the last um, siblings of my mom that, that's alive. And um, I was always gathering stories from my mom and trying to figure out who we were as a family by digging into our past. And my aunt is, she's like leaving. She's telling me she's going to leave. And she's telling me that she sees her father in the room and she sees, um, you know, my mom and they're telling her that it's going to be time soon. And she's telling me this, these stories and I'm, vi I'm taping this because I'm just interested. I've always been interested, but I see the urgency in her eyes. She's like, without speaking, she's saying, you have to carry this. And then I remember, oh, you're a mineral person because... Minerals hold the stories of the earth. And that's what it means to be a mineral person. And I think that that alignment with who I am is what has kept me here. And if it kept me here, it is possible that someone can become in alignment with why they are here. And maybe that will give them a more fulfilling experience on this earth because spirituality is wonderful and you can even escape into it, but its purpose is to cause you to have a fulfilling life here. And that's the purpose of spiritual technology. No better way to end than that. I want to acknowledge, thank you for being here, all three of you. It is important that you're here. I want to thank you all. Thank you for being here. It is important that you're here. Hope you have a beautiful evening. Thank you all. <laughs>